everyone, you're watching Lauka Enya Live, a program brought to you from the town of Lauka Enya in Bolivia's Tropico of Cochabamba, a region known for the growing of traditional coca and agriculture. It's also home to Radio Kausashwan Coca, the radio station of the six federations of the Tropico, the Campesino Union, and the president of the federation is Evo Morales. The vice president is Senate President Andonico Rodriguez, and so this is a really historically significant uh, region because of its extensive uh, history of social movement struggle and victories. The facilities we're in now are, uh, that we're currently in now were built in cooperation with the government of Venezuela between 2006 and 2009 during the first years of the movement towards socialism government. The plaque on the building says the six federations Six federations of the Topico are appreciative uh, for making possible the consolidation of an alternative and revolutionary media outlet a reality. So Radio Casashwan Coca, which as I've said is owned by the Campesino affiliates of the union, is without a doubt the most important media outlet in Bolivia. And that was particularly the case during the coup period. It was during that period last year that we launched Kausashwan News to build a platform for reporting in Bolivia in English and myself along with my colleague Ali Vargas and the rest of our colleagues here worked relentlessly to bring Bolivia to the forefront internationally. Bolivia's social movements triumphed over the fascist coup in October and as we all know the MAS is once again in power at the executive level and with a legislative majority in both houses though social struggle continues uh, and threats from both proponents of neoliberalism and fascism and the threat posed by US imperialism and multinational continues indigenous peoples here continue to fight to protect their resources their land their way of living and existence and they are fighting against explicitly racist genocidal fascist forces of the political far right here in Bolivia our reporting here in Bolivia continues as well as throughout Latin America and we are moving into a new phase of reporting, taking advantage of a real opportunity to use our platform for providing media coverage of the organized working class here and struggles elsewhere. So thanks to everyone who has supported this media project and our reporting in numerous ways. Today, we'll be discussing Ecuador which is holding presidential elections on February the 7th. These elections couldn't come sooner. President Lenin Moreno has extraordinarily low public support and it's incredible that he's made it this far, having committed countless offenses against Ecuadorian people, their sovereignty and democracy. His administration began plummeting the economy into neoliberal crisis long before he was able to use the coronavirus as any sort of an excuse. And he's also tried to make Ecuador into another backyard for the United States, reversing the gains of the citizens revolution led by former president Rafael Correa. Joining me now is Joe Emmersberger. He's a political writer based in Canada with Ecuadorian roots, whose work has focused on the Western media's distortions of events in Latin America. And he's always a knowledgeable, uh, reference for Ecuador and the region and has written frequently on FAIR.org and, and in Counterpunch. Also joining me is Andrea Guillem, an Ecuadorian feminist activist. She is a coordinator for gender and economic research for the Center of Economic and Social Rights and is joining me from Ecuador, from Quito, I believe. And to contribute to the conversation as well, we have Jose Luis Granado Ceja, a freelance writer and photojournalist based in Mexico City. And Jose Luis, like myself, had the opportunity to live in Ecuador and has followed political developments since. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. I wanted to start with Joe. This election has not necessarily uh, garnered uh, so much attention, hasn't been the talk of the town on social media and, um, and in the international news media. Why do you think people's attention should be focused on the election this coming week? Describe to us what Ecuador has lived through these past four years under Lenin Moreno. Yeah, you know, it's, it should be focused on because it really um, exposes the hypocrisy of the, of the Western media because, you know, all the, 
all the so-called sins that they hold against Venezuela and are another pretext for uh, really uh, sanctions that should be called crimes against humanity by the United States. I mean, all those things have been done by Moreno for the past four years. Uh, he's jailed uh, political opponents, including the elected vice president, Jorge Glass, the, the um, elected uh, governor of uh, Pichincha province was, was jailed. He's uh, driven his uh, high-profile Korea supporters into exile. Uh, he, he, Korea himself uh, can't return to Ecuador without being thrown in jail. Um, you know, and it's, it, he's, all, he's done all this. And he's even banned political parties. I mean, he, uh, uh, Andres Arauz barely got on the ballot because they banned one of the parties that uh, that they formed alliances with. And that, that itself is, is a result of the fact that uh, Korea's movement, when, when Moreno took the, uh, the whole uh, party, Alianza, Alianza País, which uh, Korea founded, when he took that completely to the right, um, he, he seized control of it. And uh, Korea and his allies tried to form and register a new party and have never been able to. So that put them in a very vulnerable position in terms of being able to organize. And uh, so all these things are going on, and it's totally under the radar uh, because it's a U.S. ally. So all, all these things they would scream about, and they do scream about if anything, anything like this is done in Venezuela or Nicaragua or anywhere where they're facing uh, outright insurrections, uh, you know, in Ecuador, it's just doesn't just gets completely ignored. So... It's really an open question. Even now, there's, there's, are the elections, are, are the, is the count going to be fair? Uh, could they pull a last-minute stunt, even maybe delay the elections? You know, there's rumors swirling about all sorts because the polls look really good for the uh, so-called Koreaist candidate, uh, Andres Arauz. And, and there's one, just one other thing I'd quickly mention. Uh, they're not even, they've even banned the use of Korea's image from political advertisements for, for campaign spots during this during this election. So they're not allowed to use his, his image. Uh, it, you know, it's just such a draconian and ridiculous um, measure. And again, if Ecuador were not a U.S. ally, they'd be getting ridiculed all over the world for this. I wanted to ask you if you could paint the picture of who are the candidates in the running. There's a wide range of candidates of the right wing. And of course, uh, Andre, Andres Arauz is supposed to be the only progressive candidate option. Uh, give us a give us an idea of, of who's in the running. Okay, sorry. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be sharing this conversation with you and about this topic that is urgent uh, in the international media. Um, well, yes, we have an a normal <laughs> quantity of uh, presidential. Um, formulas that it's 16. It's never in history, we have never seen this in history, that we have 16 um, uh, people that want to be president and vice president. And this is um, maybe an example, maybe this is the, the, the example of the deterioration of the institution, of the democratic institutions. So we have uh, parties, political parties that are uh, crumbling that right now we have um, the only progressive candidates in a party in a political party that it's not their own uh, so that give them uh, vulnerability in order to um, go to govern uh, if they if they win in order to to to, to have governability uh, we have 16 but only three competitive uh, binomials that is uh, Andres Arauz, uh, Guillermo Lasso, and Jacob Perez. These three binomials uh, really um, are the only ones that can make, can, that can have possibilities to win. And these three can really express uh, the, uh, pos the ideology's position of the, of the citizenship. Uh, Guillermo Lasso is a banker. He's, this is the, their third time running for president. He is the representation of the financial sector, uh, the, the sector that has made a fortune in this crisis. If we if we see um, who has earned and who has lost in this crisis, we can see that not everyone has um, uh, suffered. Uh, the bank has made uh, uh, really really rich in this in this period of, of time, and um, the other candidates, Yaku Perez. It's uh, it's the the candidate of a part of the indigenous movement. 
the indigenous movement it's really rich and it's really um, diverse and there are uh, fights in inside the indigenous movement so Jacob Perez represent one part of this uh, of this movement uh, we can say that this is the part of uh, that is more related to the political structure of the movement Pachacutic uh, but it is really um, we can say that it's not uh, much related to the uh, grassroots movement of the indigenous movement, Jacob Perez. It, that is what Jacob Perez represents. That is that is because uh, that is why he has um, a, a narrative that it's really light on, for example, economic politics. So he has their um, strong narrative that narrative that he uh, collects uh, both. Uh, with the um, with the with this narrative of the defense of nature, so that is like he's he's a strong um, uh, yeah corpse of narrative, and we have Andres Arauz that is the candidate of the progressive movement uh, in Ecuador. So these are like the three uh, most competitive candidates, and we most likely will see that in the case of a second uh, round uh, maybe these three are going to be in the in the ballot I'm glad that you've already brought up sort of the contradictions and the tensions between um, Yaku uh, and the indigenous movement more broadly and I think that's where we can bring in uh, Jose Luis as Andrea said uh, there's a diversity within the indigenous movement and um, you know the leadership of Konai might not be representative, and I know Joe has spoken about this a lot of times um, on social media. Um, in the case of Bolivia, we see that the indigenous movement is basically uh, completely at the base of the movement towards socialism. So you have people within the same mass movement, the largest party within the country, uh, who are both identifying as socialists, uh, maybe not every single person in the party, but um, and also people who represent the indigenous leadership of the country. Or in the case of Ecuador, uh, the leaders, uh, Jaime Vargas, uh, being the, the main leader of Conei, has uh, denounced and had a, a lot of friction with the Citizens' Revolution and former President Rafael Correa. Uh, tell us a bit about that, uh, Jose Luis. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you very much for inviting me. As you mentioned, I lived in Ecuador. It's a country that will always hold a very special place in my heart. I would say that when we look at the situation of the indigenous movement vis-a-vis -vis these elections, it's important to also remember the October uprising that took place recently that was very close to toppling the government of Lenin Moreno. It, historically, the indigenous movement in Ecuador has one that is very well connected to its base, but it's a base that reflects the interests of that sector of the country. So it's, it's, it's one that advocates an interest of what is development that favors their local populations. And when they are threatened by neoliberal development models like the one being implemented by Lenin Moreno, they go into action and they and, and that's why we were able to see what we did in October which was mass mobilizations really a, a a weakening of the power of the Lenin Moreno government such that it was even forced to flee Quito and relocate to Guayaquil where they're able to kind of maintain their grip on power and I mentioned this because it's in a it's a social movement that merits a lot of attention and a lot of respect but the problem in this situation is that does Yacu Perez really represent that movement? And I'm of the opinion that he doesn't. I would say that Yacu Perez in a, in a lot of ways is, is a political actor who has always actually been cozy with the right in the country. Uh, and, it, and he's said to be in economically, uh, as Andrea said, in somewhat more sympathetic to the positions that are advocated by Guillermo Lasso and the bankers. And if we look at some of the more recent uh, legislative decisions that were made, for example, la ley humanitaria, the humanitarian law, which has, which was nothing about it was humanitarian, but if anything was a punishment against the country's indigenous campesino and working class, 
Who voted for that law? Well, it was Creo, the party of Guillermo Lasso, and Pachacuti, which is the party that is supporting Yacu Perez. And so he is trying to position himself as a progressive figure. And if you look at his campaign materials, they do talk about uh, respect for the rights of mother nature, about respect for water. He himself identifies as a water defender. But in, in practice, he has not been a figure that actually truly represents the, the indigenous movement and, it, and all of its diversity. Uh, in fact, as you mentioned, there was this, this schism that started to emerge as a result of his efforts to position himself as the presidential candidate. So in, I think it's important to see that when you take that into consideration, there really are only two options. I know we have the three leading candidates that Andrea mentioned, but the two basically boils down to the progressive model, the one uh, defended by Andres Arauz, and the neoliberal model, which is de defended by Guillermo Lasso. And so making that distinction is important because the, it's, it's easy to be swept away by some of the language used by Jacob Perez and, and those who are supporting him because it does sound progressive on the surface. But it isn't, and we can get into this a little bit more and deeper. But you know, there's particularly amongst the North American audience, Western European audience, English-speaking world, there's a lot of discussion around extractivism. This idea that there's that the Correa years represented an extractivist model of development, and that's certainly true. There was an extraction of natural resources, but I would like to make a comparison with Bolivia. The question isn't, are we going to extract natural resources or not? It's important to remember that countries like Bolivia, like Ecuador, Mexico, if they are forced to sell natural resources at the international level, that's a result of imperialist domination in the first place. So unless we're actually going to try to confront the international division of labor and where countries fall in, this idea that we should write off any kind of extraction, I think is quite dangerous because it would condemn people to poverty and to misery. So when you have figures like Yacu Perez talking about, you know, the rights of Mother Earth and, and extractivism, you know, and his history of working with right wing sectors, when if he were to take power, who would benefit from extraction? And I would argue that it would actually be the sectors who traditionally benefited from the extraction. So transnational corporations, imperialist countries. And so when we when we're when we're considering the, the political scenario. Uh, it's important to to remember why the Arauz ticket, Carlos Rabascal and, and Arauz are in many of the polls in first place, because people remember the Correa years. They remember the government of Rafael Correa and all of the benefits that it brought, the redistribution of wealth that was possible under that government. And I think that helps explain a lot of why, despite four years of uh, vilification for years of criminalization of the Correista movement, they continue to enjoy a, a, a wide gamut of support in Ecuadorian society. Joe, I wanted to ask you what you believe Yacu Perez and his candidacy represents in this election. I, I just see him as a straight up opportunist, a pretty, pretty obvious one. Uh, he endorsed, he openly endorsed uh, Guillermo Lasso last election. Uh, his discourse is all, you know, when he talks about uh, the career years, about excessive debt, uh, he, he, <laughs> um, he talks about corruption. He basically just reproduces the same arguments as, as the right, but he puts an environmental spin on it. Uh, he mocked Andres Arauz for, um, for talking about recycling, you know, recycling electronics, which is actually very important. And then a video surfaced where he was advocating the same idea. But during the presidential debates, he mocked Andres Arauz for talking about recycling electronics. And, uh, uh, you know, it, the problem, it, you know, the thing is with, uh, you know, if a country like Ecuador is going to have to export uh, uh, primary primary products like oil and other natural resources. Um, so obviously, if, if uh, on a global scale, like Korea has long advocated, if, if the develop, developing countries of environmentalists and don't want them to do that, then they're going to have to pay up. They're going to have to replace that income stream with something else. And uh, Cray even had a proposal to, uh, for that, and it went nowhere because, you know, talk is cheap. But if you really want to help uh, countries kind of bypass extraction in, in, in their development, then they're going to have to get something, uh, something in return. 
And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of cash. I mean, just if you think about intellectual property and patents and the way, um, uh, well, with the COVID crisis, you know, where we see that uh, information and technology is basically hoarded by the world's most powerful governments. And they basically make it illegal uh, and expensive for, uh, for developing countries to use it. So if, if, those, if those, uh, 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 those restrictions were relaxed, were eased, you know, it would be a lot easier for, for countries to, uh, to develop and not have to do as much extraction. And also, if, if you're going to be against that extraction, uh, you, you should be uh, the, extremely devoted to redistribution, you know, because the less you have to grow, uh, the more you can re redistribute, the less you have to actually grow your economy to, to, uh, to raise living standards. But uh, when Korea, for instance, introduced uh, uh, taxes on land speculation, you know, many of the of the uh, indigenous leaders at the time were, were just echoing the same talking points as the right wing. You know, that these were unfair taxes and that they were going to hit everybody when meanwhile they were just going to impact only the richest 3%. So there's a lot of contradictions in this, uh, uh, this anti-extractivist uh, uh, discourse that's, that's thrown around. Beginning when I introduced Andrea that she has been uh, contributing uh, and collaborating with uh, this new outlet called Ecuador on Q, which um, are some friends uh, based in Quito who have uh, recently been covering these upcoming elections and um, are some of the only people who are on the ground uh, doing interviews, uh, just kind of like multimedia clips, which are translated in English, largely kind of following the same format as we do for Castro News for social media. So it's been really valuable uh, for the you know short amount of time that they've been around, and it's going to be a really important source on these elections this week. Uh, their Twitter handle is Ecuador underscore on underscore Q, and they also have a Facebook. I think they have an Instagram um, and a YouTube, uh, which has uh, all their videos. So just now, they actually uh, tweeted within the hour that former Vice President Jorge Glass has tested positive for COVID-19. And uh, Jorge Glass, as we know, has been in prison, persecuted, a political prisoner of the Lenin Moreno regime since the first uh, few months of, of his presidency, of this administration. The tweet says, according to reports, the persecuted VP is currently breathing through an oxygen mask as the virus severely affected his lungs. He has also refused to be transported to Quito. Um, this story um, of Jorge Glass has been extremely uh, just sad. It's a very extremely high profile person. He was the vice president, the first vice president of Lenin Moreno. Um, he also uh, served under uh, Rafael Correa and it actually hasn't gotten the media coverage uh, internationally that perhaps it should. Uh, but it is definitely a cause within Ecuador. They also uh, broke the news just a, a moment ago that uh, former President Rafael, Rafael Correa has tweeted that um, the CNE, which is the National Electoral Council, is currently meeting to debate uh, the outright suspension of these elections, which are supposed to take place a week from Sunday. Um, and this news comes days after Moreno's meeting with El Magro in Washington. So Andrea, what do you make of these new developments? We have Jorge Glass testing positive, a political prisoner of the regime, and that the CNE is trying to, once again, possibly delay the election. We, we have seen not only him, but uh, all the political uh, <laughs> uh, coup in the, in the Correa, um, mandate, it is persecuted now. They're in Mexico now, they're uh, out of the country, and they, that has uh, put them in a difficult place to do politics now. And that that gives uh, the movement, I think they give the movement um, this capacity of renovation. I mean, we see these new uh, figures, Andres Arauz in his, himself, it is um, a, a response of this uh, necessity of the movement of renovation. But the, the tweet that Correa has put in a few uh, an hour ago, I think, it is, it's very clear. And I think it's a message to 
the international organizations to put pressure in this in these elections in in watching these elections uh, because it is it's going to be a precedent for the democratic institutions and the demo and the democracy itself in Ecuador. Uh, we can see that there is an institutional crisis when two of the uh, top uh, institutions of, uh, of of the electoral process, the CNA, the CNE, and the TCE, are fighting each other. So we now live in uh, in a in a in a in a feeling of of completely uncertainty. So now the elections that it's going to be take uh, take place in a week from from today. Uh, it's demanding that citizens and uh, everybody to get involved in uh, in protect those votes because elections, um, I mean surveys, uh, and um, has already uh, been demonstrating the rising of the uh, of the of the voting of to to Andres Arauz. So um, the thing is to defend those votes. We we are really uh, positive now of um, maybe a second round or or even a winning in, in one round. But the I mean I I think that the challenge is going to be defended those votes here in the ground. It, it bears repeating that uh, there was a lot of political persecution since the very beginning of this government and. That continued, uh, you know, th throughout that period until the October 2019 uh, protest, when a number of people had to go hide in the Mexican embassy. Uh, some had to leave. The for former foreign minister had to uh, seek asylum, and um, some of the key leaders of the Citizens Revolution. Um, Jose Luis, do you have anything to add about the political persecution and these new developments with Jorge Glass? Yeah, I think this effort to to delay or suspend the elections should be seen as out of the playbook of Janine Añez in Bolivia. And it's the same practice, it's the same thinking that this these elections pose a threat to our, our ability to maintain our grip on power. So uh, for those that don't know, in Ecuador, there are two rounds of elections. The first one, if a candidate is unable to secure 50% or 40%, but beating the next nearest rival by 10%. In that case, there would be a second round. So like in Bolivia, in Ecuador, the oligarchy, the elites, are scared of that first round victory because he's very close. If you look at the most recent polls, he's two or three percentage points away from securing that first round victory. And that has the ruling class in Ecuador very, very nervous. And that's why you're seeing this effort. And I do, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I have seen some Analysts say that the suspension of the elections through a certain interpretation of the law could actually lead to their outright cancellation, which would perpetuate Lenin Moreno in power. You know, Lenin Moreno didn't even dare run again because of how unpopular he is. And so that's the part that I think demands international attention. But when we're talking about the international scene, it's actually one of the things, you know, Ecuador is a small country, you know, uh, but it's always punched above its weight. It's always been a country that's that's had a presence on the international scene. And, and I think that's really important because these elections will also have regional implications, you know, and I put it this way, depending on who wins, different people in the region are going to have allies. So if the candidate like Andres Arauz wins, well, you're going to see uh, Lucha Arce, uh, Fernandez in Argentina, having more support in the region. If somebody like Lasso wins, well, Duque and Bolsonaro, right? And that's going to strengthen actors like Almagro and the OAS. And so the international aspect uh, is something that definitely has to be taken in consideration. It's something that, you know, Ecuadorians who are going to vote uh, have to also consider what it means for the region. And so uh, I think when we look at that as well, we can also see the, the consequences of having different kinds of leaders. You know, you mentioned that many of the leadership of the Citizens Revolution in Ecuador had to take refuge in the Mexican embassy. Some even had to come here. Uh, you know, Evo Morales, uh, Garcia Linera had to be rescued literally by 
Mexico, uh, it, and it shows why it's important that that reconfiguration at the at the international level. I wanted to share a really quick anecdote. If you remember when Juan Guaido uh, attempted his first coup of declaring himself president, it seemed like there was a lot of momentum. You know, country after country in Latin America, if you saw the international reports, they had a country, you know, uh, Colombia and Argentina, which was then ruled by Macri, have all recognized Guaido. But you know which country didn't? Mexico. And uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, pursuant to his ideology and his manner of seeing the international scene, said, no, we, we won't we continue to recognize Maduro. We're not going to recognize this figure who's just declared themselves. And that's, that was really important. So that's why I mentioned that the elections in Ecuador could also have regional imp implications. It could be a, a, a yet another pushback against the interests of Washington and imperialism in the region to try to, once again, you know, inaugurate what we, could, what we once called the pink wave. So the leftist candidate, or the candidate of progressivism in Ecuador, Andres Arauz, was actually here on a very significant day for Bolivia and the region when Evo Morales returned to Chimoré, which is the next town over from where we are. He returned to the airport where he had to leave from in order to seek asylum in Mexico and uh, thereafter Argentina, and he had his big final welcome home rally uh, before uh, tens of thousands of people, probably more in the exterior, uh, that couldn't make it in. And it was just a massive welcome home tour that we at Casasho and News and Radio Casasho and Coco were able to cover from his entry in Argentina all the way back here. And he had some very important um, guests with him, and he actually brought on stage with him both Jaime Vargas and um, also uh, Andres Arauz. So we have a clip of him, it's subtitled. Here he is, uh, Andres Arauz, speaking in Chimoré at the airport um, upon Evo's return to Bolivia. Hermanos y hermanas bolivianas, allá la Bolivia, allá el Ecuador, allá la nuestra América Unida. Vamos a avanzar en esa integración, vamos a recuperar la UNASUR, vamos a recuperar la integración, pero no solo entre los gobiernos, no solo entre los estados. Querido Evo, necesitamos también la integración entre nuestros pueblos, entre el movimiento social de toda nuestra América. Por eso, a todo este pueblo latinoamericano, con nuestra América, vamos a retomar esa senda de la revolución ciudadana, de la constitución del buen vivir, que permitió, junto a líderes como Evo Morales aquí en Bolivia, como Rafael Correa en el Ecuador y como Matúa de grandes líderes escuchando a su pueblo supieron construir la unidad que se requiere para nuestros pueblos Muchísimas gracias ¡Hola la Bolivia! ¡Hola el Ecuador! ¡Hola la Nuestra América Unida! Ecuador's leftist candidate uh, Andrés Arauz upon his visit to um, to Bolivia, but actually I forgot to say that he did actually attend the inauguration of President uh, Luis Lucho Arce, and then he went and, uh, and joined Evo here in the rural Campesino area uh, for that momentous occasion, and of course got the very important endorsement of Evo Morales and other important leaders from Argentina and the continent. So he said we're going to advance integration. He's talking about integration between states, between peoples and social movements. He said, he says we're going to recover UNESCO. Um, he says that um, we're going to retake the pathway of the citizens' revolution uh, and go back to the policies, uh, the pathway of Rafael Correa. Uh, Joe Emersberger, let us know what you think about um, that uh, that relationship that he has with Evo Morales, that endorsement he has from Argentina, 
What, do you, what can we expect from him if he's elected? I think the persecution of Korea's movement done is it's kind of weeded out the, the worst opportunists and imposters because, uh, you know, like Moreno, think about it, he was a, he was a, a, a member of the a citizen revolution, of the Korea supporter, and it was pretty easy to be one, right? Uh, but uh, Andres, people like Andres Arauz uh, and Jorge Glass, obviously they're showing that they, they remained uh, loyal to the movement when it was very, very difficult. And uh, in fact, Andres Arauz has, has also, you know, and if you've seen the dates, he's actually set out a detailed plan that he's negotiated with Argentina for vaccines. He says, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sitting here waiting to win the election and then I'm going to start, you know, planning things. I've already planned to get vaccines through Argentina and start implementing this, you know, when I take office. So, and uh, also, uh, you know, Arosa, uh, he was also working with the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C., which, as you know, did a lot of tremendous work right away to expose Almagro's lies uh, that he put out immediately about uh, Morales' electoral victory in, in October of 2019. So Andres Arosa was right in the thick of things, uh, exposing those lies, you know, using the, the, their statistical analysis and that to, to expose the... The, the fraudulent uh, monitoring that uh, that uh, Magro did, so he, he's right in, in the right in the weeds of things, right, right in the in the nitty gritty of the economic planning and everything. Uh, you know, Moreno, um, you know, if, you, if you think about it, he was always more like an ambassador, very kind of a, a conciliatory figure who wasn't really in the thick of things. So it was a very very different. You know, apart from the protests against the Pacatazo, the austerity the state of exception uh, during October 2019 and the, um, the IMF loan, people have uh, been protesting a whole lot of other, um, a whole lot of other uh, neoliberal crisis policies. So uh, Jose Luis, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I was watching uh, uh, an interview that Correa did uh, last night with Enclave Politica with Telesur, and he actually mentioned that a lot of what this election will necessarily implicate is, is sort of refounding the country. I mean, whoever wins is going to inherit a very broken country. And I don't mean necessarily just politically, but uh, economic fortunes, it's, you, know, you mentioned the, the IMF loan. That IMF loan is still not public. Where is the information about that? What does it actually imply? Will this, the new government, whoever it may win, their, hand, their hands are going to be tied by these deals that were signed by Lenin Moreno's administration. And, and that's actually really worrisome. I think that's, that's you know, there's, there's a sense that there's going to be a, really a concerted effort to try to make up for all the damage done in the last few years. And we're talking uh, in terms of economic policy, but also health policy. You know, I, it's worth reminding the viewers today that Ecuador was a country that I think really got a lot of people's attention in terms of the seriousness of how bad things can get when it comes to COVID-19 and the coronavirus, when they had literally bodies piling up on the streets of Guayaquil. And that's due to the incompetence of the Lenin Moreno government. So it's not just one that serves elite interests, but it's also uh, mm -hmm. some sort of a, a, a political science point of view, a government that is incapable of actually rising to the challenges of the country. You know, uh, if you st declare a state of emergency, you can order private industry to respond to the crisis. Why wasn't that done? You know, instead, we had these scenes of people crying outside of hospitals. I think there's something like 80 people who still can't figure out what happened to their relatives in those days. That's how bad the crisis is. And, and I think that's the part that's particularly concerning for this new administration, not to mention the, the, the selling of public goods, uh, the moving away from the reorientation of the, of the economy that happened previously. Uh, and, and so that's, I think, particularly worrisome. Uh, I don't, and also to mention uh, a side note, I, it's interesting, we watched this clip of Andres Arauz and, and the leadership of Conaye in Bolivia as well. And, and in preparation for this program, I was reading an interview that Jacob Perez did with, did with Plan B. And actually turns out, after that visit, the leadership of Conaye hasn't been in touch with him or his campaign. So it seems like, again, to bring into the regional implications, you know, some conversations, some, some real talk was had between the indigenous movement of Bolivia with the leadership of the indigenous movement of Ecuador to say that, you know, this is an opportunity that can't be wasted. 
uh, and, and I hope that they're able to communicate that to their bases as well. Uh, and one final point, it's also worth recalling that in Ecuador, voting is compulsory. So uh, everyone is expected to vote, uh, and therefore that means that, you know, the undecideds will have to make up their, their minds before they submit their ballot, and that actually will also have pretty important implications and, and could be what pushes Arauz over the edge and get that 40% in the first round. You know, dead bodies laying out in the city of Guayaquil, the second city of Ecuador, was something that began in April. And it was absolutely shocking to the point where people on social media and other countries didn't believe this was true. They thought maybe these are just like images that people are using and just putting out fake news. But it was, in fact, completely true. And the scandals have continued. Uh, perhaps there are no longer those sorts of issues. Uh, with you know bodies laying out in the streets, no morgue, no no one uh, to facilitate the transfer of those of those bodies. Uh, but there are still some other issues related to coronavirus. And so, Andrea, I wanted to ask you, uh, who's in Ecuador now? Um, you know, first of all, you know, there's been some issues with vaccines. Uh, not a lot of vaccines being brought into the country. Maybe you can tell us a, a bit about the handling of COVID-19 now in the country and also are people connecting these failures to uh, to manage the coronavirus crisis with the fact that you know Lenin Moreno is represented in the can and his administration is represented in the candidacy of uh, of Guillermo Lasso are people making that connection that we're just going to see more of this if we elect this uh, billionaire banker Yeah, thank you for the question. I just want to make a few points about the the video that you that you show us. Um, and I think that um, Bolivia was a scenario that allowed a dialogue between Jaime Vargas and Andres Arauz. Both of them shared um, this in the platform where uh, where Evo was standing, and I think that uh, allows them to dialogue and then we, we we saw the sunday the last sunday they meet in a in a market in puyo and that and conaye said that it was that this was casual that it wasn't planned but what we but if we uh hear the conversation and we uh hear closely the details it's very important the conversation because um what Jaime Vargas said to Arauz, it is, uh, we, we, we are we're standing by you, but with conditions. So these are the conditions. And he uh, told a number of things that is important for the indigenous movement. So that is a really um, strong uh, uh, backlash for Jaco Perez. And uh, we, we, can, we can see that this are this this uh, in this encounter is going to be uh, crucial in the in the voting in voting day. Another thing that I wanted to say about about this uh, the October strike that was 13 days. Um, it is it is true that indigenous movement was the the principal uh, corp of resistance of, of resistance in the streets, but there was also the citizen revolution in the street. There were also women that um, was in the street and the students. So uh, the strike of October 19 was a very diverse movement and very um, plural one. And the other thing that you asked me about the vaccines and the COVID-19 uh, crisis, it is absurd <laughs> that one year uh, after the first, um, the first lockdown, the people feels that we're in the same place. We don't, we don't feel like we have uh, moved forward to uh, a better health system, uh, more security uh, in the health system. We, we, we have this feeling that we are already in the same place one year ago. And the last, um, uh, the last crisis of, no, 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 no crisis, the last the, the, the last news that we uh, we saw this uh, health minister that uh, it's now implicated 
in traffic in traffic inf influence uh, because he has uh, he has made a terrible um, administration of the vaccines. We have just four thousand vaccines that represent zero point zero three percent of the population. So that is nothing, and uh, the worst of it it's it's not to uh, ensure the first line uh, fighters of, of this crisis, they, they have been putting these vaccines to the friends of the government. So they have bought with public spending vaccines for their friends. And this is a clear sign that we have uh, a state that is fractionary, a state that, is, uh, that functions like, uh, like hacienda, una hacienda. The state uh, we we see that has fraction and to to ensure governability, what Moreno has done is to uh, to give the state to the elites. So it's absolutely um, nefast nefasto. Sorry, my English is like not the best, <laughs> but it is it is really really bad the administration of this crisis, and that is why. People look Andres Arauz as the only candidate that has taken the vaccination plan in its um, like the first thing of their of their program. I have so many more questions for each of you, but I'm going to just give the last question to Joe. Joe Embersberger, I wanted to ask you what your prediction is. Do you think, according to these polls, we saw? We saw that the average uh, of, the, of a number of polls that were recently conducted on voter intention shows that Arauz, the leftist candidate, is supposed to win. He's about three points, three percentage points away from possibly winning within the first round with possibly no need for a second round. That would be quite incredible. What's your prediction? Do you think they're going to be able to, do you think the right, Lenin Moreno, uh, will be able to delay these elections? Do you think they'll go forth? What do you think the outcome will be if they do go forth next Sunday? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's, it's wide open. It's wide open. What the, you don't know if the votes will be counted fairly, if the election will be delayed. It's, it's up in the air. They're, they're very scared, which shows you uh, that they're even floating these kind of ideas, shows you how panicked they are because they know that, yeah, what you're saying, the numbers are all showing. And these polls, you know, you got posters like Sedatos and Market who are very biased against uh, Carell. So the polls look great for them, but there are a lot of unknowns. And, and unfortunately, we can't count on the ballots being counted fairly, and we can't count on the, uh, uh, the election even being held on time. So it, it's, that's also, uh, an, but um, I will say that I, I don't think Carell's hands are tied if he takes office. I know because uh, that's why we see, if, if you read the news, there's so much intensification of U.S. hostility towards China is because they know that their uh, former levers of power through the IMF, through those kinds of institutions, are not what they were, not even close. There's a, a large lender out there that's, that, that can give countries like Ecuador or other options, not just Ecuador, the whole region. So there's uh, so I don't think Carlos's hands will be tied if he's he, you know he'll have, he'll have to remove a lot a, around a lot of things maybe maybe even he says he doesn't discard the idea of having another constituent assembly to really clear up the, the legal mess that has been made over the last several years but uh, we'll see I, he has a superb chance of winning um, but a lot of unknown so it's hard to say. Much for joining us on Lauka Enya Live. Uh, our guests, Joe Emmersberger, Andrea Guillem, and Jose Luis Granado Seja. Um, you guys have been wonderful guests, uh, but we're short on time. So you can find us on Twitter, Facebook. We have a YouTube, fairly new, and a Patreon where you can support Campesino Union owned reporting in Bolivia. And I want to thank our team. Willie, our tech colleague, Ollie, of course, my co-producer at Kasashwan News, and the rest of our colleagues here at Radio Kasashwan Koga. Thanks again, guys. See you next time. <laughs>